Hello and welcome back to My Mom's Basement. It is Robbie Fox and I am here with the one, the only, Freddie Prince Jr. He's got a new podcast, Wrestling with Freddie. Freddie, thank you for taking the time to do this and uh, how are you? I'm very well, man. I appreciate you having me on the show. Thanks very much. And uh, I know we said this off air, but on air, it needs to be acknowledged. The hair is glorious. <laughs> thank it you. It is a sight to behold and respect. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. You have such an interesting perspective on this podcast. I listened to a few episodes of it. And oh, obviously, I know I'm such a huge wrestling fan. So I know your history in the WWE and stuff like that. But you're an actor, a fan, a writer who worked at the WWE. You got to see how the sausage was made a little bit. And you worked with a lot of the top names. I'm sure you may know it's around this time of year. I don't know if you know it's actually today. If someone told you it is 13 years to the yes. day. Yes. Jeff at Hardy. Armageddon. Yep, that Jeff Hardy won his first WWE championship. I know That's that this so is a storyline you're super heavily involved with. You fought yeah. for this storyline. So yeah. when that moment actually happened, when the culmination of that happened, like I'm a kid watching that, losing my mind. It meant so much to me that moment. Like, what did it mean to you? Uh, what you just said is what I hoped Jeff's fans would feel. Yeah. Jeff's fans. I never felt got serviced in the WWE or in life. Um, anyone who's not mainstream, if it's not something familiar to the mainstream, they just ridicule it until it goes away. Or if they see it make money, they they harvest it and and dilute it and turn it in turn it into a croissant sandwich or something. And uh, I always connected to Jeff, and I thought every outcast in the world connected to Jeff, and it was such when Freebird said it was his idea to make Jeff champion, but it was my story that got him there. And he asked me to come up with that story and to write those promos. And, and, you know, the whole philosophy on that was I didn't want to hide from Jeff's problems and Jeff's issues. And I didn't want to hide from any sort of drug addiction or any sort of addiction issues at all. And so my father, in the 70s, he was a huge stand-up comedian. He had the number one sitcom in the country. He had just stolen the Caesars Palace gig from Bill Cosby on some sly shit because he was a straight gangster like that. And he probably knew Cosby was a scumbag anyway. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but he was, you know, he was the man, but he messed with drugs big time. He had enough quaaludes in his system to kill a horse the night he shot himself in the head. So my whole philosophy on the Hardy promos was. I never want anyone calling my dad like a junkie or things like that. Like, how do I make my dad a sympathetic character? I have my whole life to figure that out. So I tried to apply that philosophy to Jeff and we took away the black and white and only focused on the gray area of life, right? Like the, the, the gray, Star Wars fans would be like, gray Jedi's, they're real. Um, <laughs> I'm like, that, we'll get into Star Wars, I gotta bring it up. I've literally <laughs> got a lightsaber tatted on my arm here. So oh, bro, I got um, the Kanan lightsaber right behind me, right back there in that box, dude. Yeah, I mean, I would be remiss not to mention Oh, and you can see the Mandalorian. That. Yeah, too, I would I be remiss it. not to mention, yeah. I've been Star exposed. Wars guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're both exposed together. Yeah. So yeah, so the, the gray area was really where I tried to focus on and, and I really just tried to, again is like how how do you make an addict sympathetic it's been done before hollywood's done it a million times so i really focused on that and it was a crazy team effort man it was a crazy we had a lot of wild stuff to, to derail that and i talk about it in an upcoming episode that we recorded we talked the whole the whole episode is the jeff hardy storyline and uh we talk about the night of armageddon but we lost power we had no way to to have lights or shoot, and then in comes. It was like it was like what's his face, Vigo Mortensen in the Lord of the Rings. Like <laughs> in comes in comes Stephanie McMahon with the wind in her hair, and we're shooting, and she's not settling for anything else. And I'm looking at her like there we have no light, and she's like we're gonna find it, and everyone's digging through. I got a flashlight, I got this, and she finds this crazy green pen light. And I see a, like a whiskey highball glass. And she goes, will this work? And I go, give me, yeah, give me the light, give me the light. And I shine it through the highball glass and it looks really cool on Jeff. And, and I say, okay, Steph, you shine this on Jeff. I'll hold these cue cards and I'm gonna move them around Jeff so that you can kind of like search the whole field and you know move in pain, right? Every movement should be motivated by pain. So when I moved the card, that was his kind of cue to like hurt and then go up here and find it. because. We didn't always have time to memorize stuff. We, it's a, 
it's live, you know, it's, it's tough. So, uh, so we just do this whole thing and the whole time I'm looking at Steph and I'm like, I, I love you. Like not, I'm in love with you. Just like I, I was sit ready to sit there and be like, wow, we're screwed. Like I yeah. was not solution oriented in that moment, but her last name is McMahon and this is her company and there is no fail. There's, she's down in the foxhole with you guys. In no, that this moment. girl, her hands are getting dirty, literally dirty, yeah. digging through trash, dig, whatever we can find. And once I see someone willing to roll their sleeves up like that, I, I had a whole new life. And we had our issues, believe me. Stephanie and I do not see eye to eye on everything. Um, but man, I, I respect the hell out of her. And it was all because of that moment. I, and still to this day, I respect the hell out of her. That's awesome. I want to go back and rewatch that promo now and like Watch look it. for that. I'm going to that's, after because I have that's to. Stephanie now, yeah. McMahon, gaffer <laughs> extraordinaire. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of fans, I feel like, put this dark cloud over the idea of a writer's room in wrestling. And it may be because a lot of times wrestlers will leave a company and they'll say they had frustrations with the writer's room or a writer. How justified do you feel that is from someone that worked in the writer's room and was trying to make this product better? I'm sure everyone has the intention of let's make this the best product it is. Absolutely. So this is twofold first thing i don't think writers are 100 percent necessary i think there's a lot of wrestlers that can and if they don't should write their own promos for every wrestler that can't a writer is necessary however you have to spend time with the talent okay otherwise it's your words coming out of their mouth and it may not be their their, their speed, their pace, their, you can make someone look like crap and your sole function as a writer is to get the talent over. The first promo I wrote for Jeff was horrible. It was, now when I wrote it, it was friggin' gold, man. I wrote every line that writers would never let me say because my movies were all sweet rom-coms and you have to fall in love with the sweet boy, okay? So I'm looking at this, I'm like, this is so good. Like, I wish I could say it. Well, that's why I wrote it, right? Yeah. So I'm showing this to Jeff the first time and he's not clicking with it at all. So the promo sucks. It's not, it, it instantly sucks because it's no longer about him. It's about me. So I'm listening to the words that he says, we had no time together. I never got to hang out. We're still not friends to this day. I don't know his number. I emailed him every promo weeks and events, never emailed me back. I don't think he even <laughs> saw him. It was probably a work email that he didn't check. So this was all on the fly. And I'm just listening to how he speaks and how he talks. And he keeps saying, instead of imagination, which was a word I wrote in there, he's saying imagination. And so I'm changing that. And he starts talking about, you know, how the black and white, and, or he didn't say black and white. He was talking about good and evil. And so I turned that into black and white, right? And so it was just listening to how he spoke. So that first promo we did together was the worst of all the promos we did. Because I didn't know Jeff. Like I'd seen Jeff talk, but again, those were other people's words, not his. Yeah. And he had never been known as a talker, right? And so my goal was to make make that work. And so if you go in there and you're like, well, make what I wrote, awesome, then you suck. So you have to go in there and be like, all right, this is Play-Doh and this is what I made, but it isn't dried up yet. <laughs> so let's let's reform this. And And once we got pretty good at that, then I was able to just write everything and i'm telling you man i made it sound like i would spend a week on those promos when i had it i was writing them in five minutes and then just watching whatever i wanted to watch on tv and i wouldn't turn it in until show day because i didn't want 40 people to see it right so that yeah. takes us to the second fold of this i'll be the first to acknowledge not all the writers have good ideas okay there's plenty of the ideas that get shot down and you're like oh thank god all right but there's a handful of them at least when i worked there and this is a long time ago that had good ideas all the time. They would pitch you 10 ideas and seven of them were great. And if you're batting seven for 10, that's awesome. But when we go to production, which is the production day, the day of Monday Night Raw, the day of SmackDown, which we shot on Tuesdays back then, there's 40 people in the production room and each one of them is allowed and encouraged to give notes on every segment, every match and every promo. Now, it's one thing if Bruce Pritchard, who I love, says, yeah, there's a lot of talk, and that gets, your, that gets your segment killed, right? That's okay. There's too much talk in wrestling already. Almost, I feel like everything should be in the ring. I, I, backstage segments are always kind of weird to me, um, and even though I get more love for those than my in-ring stuff. Um, <laughs> but that's one thing you can deal with. But once you get 40 people giving notes on dialogue in a promo, 
it's really difficult. Now people crap all over the writer's room for this, but understand this, the same thing goes on in Hollywood. When I read a script from a, from a writer in, let's say in the nineties, when there wasn't a script, a romantic comedy out there that didn't come across my desk before it went across someone else's. Okay. So this is a while ago. <laughs> There's eight, 18 dudes before me. Um, but back then those came through, I would read the script and based off the quality of that script, and whoever else was gonna be involved, I would say yes or no. From that moment, every draft of that script got worse and worse and worse and worse. And it wasn't one time because of the writer. It's because there's eight producers, 14 executive producers at the studio, and each one of them wants to have a fingerprint on this script so that when someone says, oh, that part of the movie was so cool, they can say, oh, that's, that, was my, that was my note. That's not a bad thing. Every human wants to have some involvement in it, but it does at times often damage the quality of a script. And the same thing is true for WWE. So it's not always the writer's fault. A lot of times, I don't believe an agent should have dialogue approval over something I wrote because I feel I'm a better writer than this person. In that company, they did. And so yeah. you would have to finagle those things and not always write your best script first, which is weird, but that happens in Hollywood too, because they know they're going to get a bunch of crappy notes. And so they go, yeah, okay. And they just put an asterisk on the line and then they change it to whatever they want. And then before the executive can criticize them again, they go, hey, that was a great note. And then the executive's ego is satisfied and they go, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, good. I had an influence on the script. And that's what like the real sharp writers do. Like Meryl Streep is famous for, if she doesn't like a note a director gives her, she goes, I just, I just don't know if I'm good enough to do that. It's Meryl friggin' Streep, <laughs> all right? Now, she may talk trash about MMA, but I don't give a shit about her opinions on MMA. You know, I really, that was like, <laughs> when I first got hired by Barstool, she gave that speech like a week later and I didn't even have like the rights to publish my own blogs, but I'm the MMA guy at Barstool, so I had to. And I like went behind someone's back, I hit publish and that was, wound up being a big thing. I had a little feud with Meryl Streep, it was good. Everyone got, I'm like, why are you kidding? She don't know what a rear naked choke is. Like, <laughs> don't worry about what Meryl Streep says. She doesn't care what Hoist Gracie says about uh, she devil you know what I mean <laughs> like it's it's all good man it's all good oh that was but yeah funny. so the, I get people's complaints and, and criticisms and sometimes they're legit but a lot of times it's just it's their criticism is the straightest line and unfortunately the line is it, there is no straight line it's yeah it's a map that is a a Thomas guide, which is a term young people don't know. We had to use maps before our phones told us where to go. And it was like looking at a spider web. It was impossible <laughs> to get anywhere. I'm surprised. I, I missed out on auditions because I just couldn't find them. So, it, you know, that's what it's like going through that process. It's incredibly difficult, and even if you have something great. Yeah. So you mentioned, even though you were so heavily involved in this Jeff Hardy storyline, you didn't work with him a ton face to face, I suppose. Who were your favorite talents that you did work with face to face a ton and in your time at WWE? Oh, man, that's it's a long list, man. I had I had some good times. I loved our truth. I loved every opportunity I got to work with truth. I didn't get many because he was on raw and they had they had the more seasoned writers and they felt I could help SmackDown more. Um, so I was over there more, but I loved Santino. I still love Santino to this day. Um, all the girls I worked with, I really loved. If I would have stayed, they were gonna put me, Stephanie told me this, uh, originally they were gonna put me in charge of the women's division. And then the first time I quit when I came back, she said they were gonna make me the head writer of SmackDown. And they were disappointed when I left. I started laughing. She said, why are you laughing? I go, nobody wants that job. I was like, Vince doesn't even read the script until it's showtime. I was like, no, <laughs> there's no way I would have taken that job. And she's like, well, that's not true. I'm like, that's 100% true. And you know, it's true. We talked about it a year ago. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, man, all the, all the female talent, like in, like, look, there's a reason all the women I've worked with in movies, I'm still friends with to this day, because I'm not a piece of shit. And, uh, and so that's why I got along so well with, with the wrestlers there too, because I wasn't a piece of shit. Um, so I really, I'm still friendly with, with Eve Torres to this day. I was at her wedding with Henner. I was going to um, say the uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu connection you she, have there, she's right? She's the reason my kids take jiu-jitsu. You know what I mean? Like they both fell, I trained with Jean Jacques Machado, yeah. but I used to train with Henner and Hiron and Alex Stewart over there. But it's just, it's an hour and a half drive for me to train for an hour, or I can go to Jean Jacques Machado in 20 minutes and train all day. So, uh, so yeah, man, they, she's responsible though for my, for my daughter starting. My daughter didn't think it was cool until she saw Eve do it. That's awesome. Um, yeah, man. So I still have a lot of love for them. You know, I'm really tight 
these days he didn't even work there when I worked there with with uh, Xavier Woods because he had me host his up up down down uh, Dungeons and Dragons game for their season. I remember three. that. Yeah. Yeah. So him and I have become super, super tight. And he, he was on your podcast too. People could check that yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah. He was a guest on the podcast, man. And I just, I love him to death. He was the first, like, in, he was here sitting right in that black chair right there. Oh, cool. He was the first one I had. He just happened to be in LA. But, uh, but yeah, man, I love wrestlers. They're very blue collar. Actors aren't very blue collar, but the ones that are, I'm friends with. Um, <laughs> that's why I'm friends with more stuntmen, though. Like before, like I'm still friendly with my very first stuntman. He got super buff. I didn't, so he could no longer be my stuntman. Not like there's a lot of stunts <laughs> and romantic comedies. This was one I know you did last summer. But uh, but yeah, man. So wrestlers have always been. Uh, I think that and stand-up comedy are the two hardest and and require the most commitment of any entertainment art form in the business. And so I have a lot of respect for both. Yeah, I could absolutely see that. Um, have you seen Heels, the wrestling drama on Stars? No, and I feel really bad. I was my just buddy, curious because you, you know you kind of have the connection. Him. Yeah, yeah, and I think Kia was Kia on that show. No, Kia was on the other show. Kia Stevens was on the other sh uh, wrestling show that I didn't watch. But I, everybody thinks I'll like it, and I play a lot of video games and don't watch a lot of TV, and oh. I have two kids and three dogs so the free time i have is usually call of duty or sea of thieves and uh or playing like dungeons and dragons like after the kids go to bed with friends here at the house last night we played some Catan. it was amazing and uh so yeah so i don't watch a lot of scripted television just because i don't have time for it but i haven't heard bad things about it my buddy thinks i yeah, like it it's a good show it's well written it's by uh michael waldron he's a friend of the show he wrote uh loki he wrote the new doctor strange he's a really good writer oh word um so it's, oh, it's here, definitely crazy worth here, here's a secret story maybe it's not secret now but here's a story about dr strange it was supposed to be a horror movie oh and yeah the, oh so everybody knows this already is it um, not a secret anymore sort of i think yeah it's sort of out well that's there, why that the original director direction. well because it's disney and they're not bringing horror they're not allowing horror into the franchise so that's why the director walked off because that one wanted to make a, a horror movie and they didn't I would love to see them expand like and oh, I love the variety. I'm such a big MCU fan that I'm like, give me a little bit of everything. Like it's, that would that would be kind of neat. It's so crazy now. There's a stand-up comic named Mark Norman who uh literally just had a joke talking about how hard it was for adults when he was growing up. And he's a little bit younger than me. I'm 45. I think he's probably 37, 38. And he said, you know, they worked all the time. They complained. He goes, adults were losing then. Kids were winning. He goes, adults are winning now. He goes, we watch Avengers. We love Captain America. We play video games. We do this. We do that. And it's so true, man. I mean, you can see the background behind me. That's not for show. Like, that's all the crap that yeah, I, I like. I got man. like a baby Yoda to my left. Like, I'm the same exact way. A baby yeah, Yoda. Man. I got a, you know. All, I got a Solomon a Grundy comic that's like not even a valuable one. It's just nice. one that I really liked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Solomon Grundy, great character, yeah. great villain in the, in the DC right. repertoire. I would, so I said, I, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. And I wanted to ask you because Star Wars has been a thing in my life since I was born. Like my brother named his firstborn Luke and he's my older brother. So he, he introduced it to me. His daughter's middle name is Ray. So it's like such a family thing. And he introduced wrestling to me at the same early age. Like it's always been a thing in my life. What is it about these things that makes people such lifelong fans because i know the day i die i still love wrestling and star wars so i think my personal opinion is that it's a it's a literary tool archetype characters are the most not only the most relatable characters but the most predictable characters it's why law and order has been on for 500 years <laughs> yeah. um archetype characters and george lucas was great at this when he was making movies. You were who you were, right? There was no in between. There were good guys and bad guys. And that was it. And he would define these characters in specific ways. So let's look at like my favorite Star Wars villain, which is Darth Maul, most people's favorite, right? The video games, the, the stupid force unleashed ruined Darth Vader because you could literally <laughs> kill him without taking any damage, which is so stupid. Well, those um, aren't canon anymore. So thank yeah. God. They, like, there's no such <laughs> thing as canon, by the way. Like yeah, what I you know, like. Yeah. I don't think it's yeah. So, head uh, canon. That's what I say. Everyone has their own head canon. Exactly. So Darth Maul is Sisyphus. And and this is by definition of George Lucas and Dave Filoni, not Freddie Prince Jr. So Sisyphus, if you don't want to check out Greek mythology, you don't have to, I'll explain it. 
He was cursed to roll a boulder up a mountain for all eternity, only to have it roll all the way back to the bottom when he gets to the top or regardless of how high he gets. At a certain point, it's always going to roll to the bottom. And he knows this going in. He knows his life is destined for the uphill climb for repeated failure after repeated failure for all eternity. And that is Dark Maul. And that's why people love him because human beings, and it's more men than women, are incredibly hard headed. It's the reason sayings like Albert Einstein comes up with doing the same thing but expecting a different result is insanity. Yeah, man, we're guys and we're stupid and we'll run our head into a wall twice because we think maybe the first time we didn't do it hard enough to break it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's just how we are. So we relate to a guy like that. Now to the point, and so many people have blurred the line, right? Of the good guy, bad guy and made our good guys, bad guys like a stone cold Steve Austin that now that line gets so muddy that it's it's an accepted way of storytelling. So when we don't see those characters, we suddenly start to get angry and upset. But originally Star Wars was never supposed to have those. It's only until just recently, like they only let one Han Solo be Han Solo. Yeah. If everybody gets to be a Han Solo, then no one in the movie is cool. Yeah. No one in the movie is cool. Like if everyone's Balky from Perfect Strangers, then everyone's just a goofball. And there's, you don't see the heart. You don't see the love. This show's too old for you, but it was a funny show back in the day. <laughs> it is a little um, too old for me. I'll admit I didn't get a, the reference. A little? No, a lot. <laughs> okay. So, but it's it, the point is there's a reason there's a straight man and a funny man, right? There's a reason that that dynamic exists. If it, There's a reason Walter Matthau and Jack Lemmon made any movie they wanted to, even when they were 90 years old and did grumpy old men and grumpier old men. There's a reason that movie could still make money, even though no one from the younger generations knew who the hell they were, but it still worked because it was a classic example. And as those lines get blurred, I think you start to lose audiences and wrestling blurred that line huge. Now, granted, it was the most successful period in the history of wrestling, but once that line is blurred, it can never be unblurred. So yeah. when you see a, a, a wrestling character come in now as the pure baby face, we hate him. We hate him. And when we see him come in as the pure villain, we love him. And it's all Darth Maul's fault. You, <laughs> you can blame Ray Park and, 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 and Sam Witwer. Like it, and so once we get reprogrammed as an audience, I'm the only guy that liked the first act of Solo. Well, no, no, I'm not. Everyone 45 and up like the first act of solo because it was slow it was drawn out yeah. and everything did we didn't learn everything about the character in the first 30 minutes but that's every pilot you watch now on television it's one of the reasons i stopped watching tv and getting back into video games i was just like man you hit me with a whole season in one episode but that's the new norm and guess what i'm not 18 to 35 i'm no longer the key demographic they shouldn't be making this shit for me i don't buy as much stuff as you guys do i know what i like i already bought it like, I, don't, I don't want anything else. I don't care about what toothpaste you sell because I already decided that I like this one. So, you know, it's all a business, like my Uncle Ron used to say, show business, which word's bigger. Um, and we always have to remember that. But, you know, as audiences get programmed, they're going to want more of those hybrid characters. And Stone Cold made, you can blame Stone Cold and Darth Maul. They, yeah. they, cha they changed the game forever. And those are always our favorite characters now. The ones that might kick your ass, but they'll still do the right thing. That's one of my favorite comparisons ever. I think you're the first person to ever put <laughs> Stone Cold and Darth Maul in the same sentence together. And it's perfect for this show because we talk about Star Wars <laughs> and we talk about wrestling on this show. So, Freddie, thank you for the time. It's been great getting to talk to you. Um, I really appreciate it. And everyone check out Wrestling with Freddie. It's a great podcast, great stories, great guests. Appreciate you, man. I have not seen your show before. I'm definitely going to watch it because you're just a younger version of me. So uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's awesome, an honor. That, that's a great comparison. I'll take <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, we cool. like all the same stuff man yeah <laughs> thanks freddie thanks bud